What's up, everyone? Today we are going to talk about the postmodernists. And what we're going to do in this discussion over the next two days is today I'm going to give you some case study tangible examples of uh, how postmodernist has postmodernism has sort of um, worked its way into everyday culture. And then on our next lecture, we're actually going to back up and do more of the theoretical concepts uh, in the book. In that section, it's known as cultural studies, but it's really rooted in Marxism. And so we'll have more of the theoretical discussion next time. Today, we just want to we just want to sort of highlight some of the ways in which uh, postmodernist uh, thinking has sort of infiltrated specifically in the art community. All right. Now, this is a very contentious debate. Um, we won't hide that it's a very contentious debate. Uh, among scholars, among artists, among those who create, among those who, um, you know, patron the arts, etc. Uh, and but I'm going to try to be as neutral as possible in presenting. I'm going to give you some uh, additional resources uh, down below in the comments. There are a couple of YouTube clips um, that I want you to click on um, in order to sort of, uh, yeah, to, to give you a little bit more background information as to what this looks like. Um, right now, I'm just going to try to explain some of the differences. Uh, and then we'll talk about, you know, Marxism next time as far as the theoretical underpinnings, all right? So the big thing with the postmodernist, right, is it comes from this place of trying to uh, flatten these ideas of objective standards and get into a world where everything is subjective. Um, so we'll see this, you know, th through sort of like more traditional Renaissance art and then into sort of today's modern art. Uh, there's, there's this huge gap between um, skill levels. There's this huge gap between sort of what is produced on the canvas, for instance. Um, however, you know, the postmodernists, they're very into this idea of subjectivity um, and flattening hierarchies. Um, if everything is subjective, then there can no there there can be no hierarchies because there are no longer objective standards for what is good um, or what is correct. Um, but instead, postmodernists get really really concerned with power and how power manifests in hierarchies. Right. So if there are these hierarchies and some people have power at the top, there are people who don't have power at the bottom. And one of the ways to flatten those hierarchies is to just say, well, the people at the top have these um, unsubstantiated objective standards when really their standards are just subjective. So if people at the bottom can say, well, we have uh, a different set of standards that are just as good as your standards in, let's say, the production of art or architecture, then all of a sudden everything becomes this um, becomes a contest of subjectivity as opposed to uh, objectivity. All right. So I'll try to tease this out a little bit more as we as we move forward and give you some examples. So the first thing I want you to do uh, is, you know, pause for a second. All right. And watch this YouTube clip. It's a quick little five minute video by this artist uh, who's also a professor named Rob, uh, Robert Florzik. Right. And he tries to tease out this idea of what makes good art versus what makes bad art. Right. And again, within the art community itself, there is this debate as to whether or not um, objective standards can apply, right? So if, you know, this whole idea of like, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, if I find something that I think is beautiful or worth looking at, um, why is it that, you know, that is any different than let's say, you know, let's say I'm really bored with looking at the Mona Lisa. Um, why is it that I can't think that something created by Jackson Pollock, um, who is highlighted in this um, YouTube clip. Why, why would I, you know, how, you know, why can't I say that Jackson Pollock is more, you know, brilliant or genius or artistic or skillful? You know, he, he's, he's, he's a better painter um, than, you know, Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, right? If we just sort of flatten all objective standards, uh, then all of a sudden the production of anything as long as it you know causes me to stare at the canvas long enough um, becomes reason to say that that is quote unquote good art all right uh robert florzak has problems with this as you will see in the youtube video um especially when it comes to the ways in which uh you know the art world sort of ebbs and flows as far as you know how much things cost who is like the the hit artist at the moment um yeah, and so you can watch him sort of tease out some of these ideas, and I'm sure that there's uh, some of the things he mentions that you all have probably 
um, thought about if, if you're in the art community or if you're not in the art community, I'm sure there's ways in which you've gone to museums before um, and you're like, you know, this is just a blank canvas with a blue line across it. Like, why is this hanging on the wall? Robert Florzak would ask the same question. He would say, like, this is, you know, this is kind of becoming silly uh, with regard to some of the things that are currently passing off as art. Um, just just a quick thing. Uh, this painting on the left here, uh, this is a painting that he has done. Um, so he is, you know, he's a skilled artist uh, as well as a professor. Uh, so he's sort of in the world. Right. So listen to him as opposed to listen to me when it comes to some of these art critiques. So movements in the art world, all right, um, and again, this will all feed back into our discussion on Marxism next time. Um, but the movements in the art world, like they start off, you know, as far as like current day, you know, what you're going to find in a museum, um, start off very classical and traditional. So if you think about it, you know, different examples of paintings, music, dance, etc. All right, you have people like Mozart. This is a um, this is Michelangelo's uh, Sistine, part of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and down here we have the ballet Swan Lake. One thing that is important to recognize with regard to more classical, traditional pieces of art is the amount of time and dedication uh, that goes into the production of this kind of work, right? So the Sistine Chapel takes somewhere between two and three years to complete, right? Mozart's compositions take a long time to complete, right? Uh, and it's not just the music, but it's also the production. You know, most of Mozart's work was also an opera. So you you get into, you know, how do you produce an opera from nothing, right? As far as you got to figure out what the story is and you got to put it to music. You got to figure out what language it's going to be in. Is it going to be in German or French or um, uh, some other ones, um, like Italian? Thank you. Uh, um, if you think about the ballet, right? If you think about a trained classical, you know, ballerina, Right. You're talking about people who have been working on this skill since they were four or five years old. And then maybe when they're in their early 20s, they might get some sort of principal lead in a company. All right. It just takes a long time to develop these skills um, and just sort of like, yeah, it's this is high cost uh, production that that, go, that, uh, that that goes into all of this work. Right. Um, and it, it is very elite because of that. Right. If it takes a lot of time to produce this stuff. It means that only people who have access to that type of time, so somebody is funding, right, their 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 livelihood, so that they continue, to, so that they can continue to produce this work. It becomes this very sort of elite club of people who have the ability to partake in the production of art, right? Um, there are these sort of tropes of the starving artist. Well, the starving artist artist happens until that starving artist has that one hit, and then maybe after the selling of that first painting, let's say then the artists can sort of take on artwork full time and they can sort of live off um, the selling of that first painting for a long time so that they have the time to produce more and more and more paintings. Um, same is true, you know, with 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 uh, various dancers, right? Like it's not a lucrative career uh, to be a professional ballerina. There are sort of like very, very high elite um, ballerinas or choreographers that, you know, are making more money than most, right? But for the most part, like it's a, it's this sort of long struggle um, because you're just not making a lot, all right? Um, so a lot of time, energy, and money goes into this kind of stuff. Um, but perfection, put in quotes, right? Um, being able to produce that sort of high quality, detailed work that nobody else could produce, like it takes a lot of time, all right? So that's a lot of, you know, these are some of the things that go into when we think about sort of more classical traditional artwork is the amount of time and energy and money needed uh, to invest in this kind of stuff. And like the, the, just what are the, the high standards for this, right? They are shooting for perfection, all right? Um, so there is one thing, you know, after you watch that Robert Florzak lecture, um, I do want you to watch this quick YouTube clip. I'll put that down below as well. Um, it's a 10 minute, it's near the end. Um, it's the... Uh, it's the dance uh, at the end of the Nutcracker. Um, and I just want you to pay attention to it, right? Just just watch the movements and think about sort of, you know, how, even if you're not into ballet, right? But think about it, like how difficult it is to sort of be in some of these positions that the, that the, 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 the male and female dancer, like they put, that they put themselves in, 
right? And how long it has to take in order to train your body in order to do these certain things, right? Whether it's dancing on top of your tiptoes, right? Whether it's sort of like a full elevated split, right? Um, you know, jumping into the air. Just think about like how difficult it is to do those things. And then think about how flawless and how easy the bout, like the, like the dancers make it seem, all right? Which is one of the sort of elements of sort of more classical traditional stuff. It's like, this stuff is so impossible to create, but then when the artist makes it, it looks so graceful and, and effortless. When really you look at it and you're like, that's impossible. Like people shouldn't be able to produce that kind of work. Um, like the impossibility of like painting the Sistine Chapel, right? Um, you look at it and you say like, how did some, like how did this happen? Uh, it, it almost seems, you know, sort of like above human capabilities. Uh, but again, like somebody did make it happen, right? Um, and so watch this, you know, uh, 10 minute dance from the Nutcracker and just sort of think about the time, energy, effort and, and uh, that, that goes into sort of trying to create something that looks this effortless. Okay, so now as we shift out of the more classical traditional uh, ways of, uh, of artistic expression, we get into what are known as the modernist and now we're sort of like modernist and we get to the postmodernist, right? Um, and some of the examples, right, we, we have people like Picasso, who is sort of this transitory figure, right? So he starts off as this very accomplished sort of classical painter. Um, and then he moves into uh, sort of his own style with regard to modernism, cubism, sort of very abstract, right? You, you look at a Picasso painting and everything's very, uh, the, the more famous Picasso paintings, we'll say. Um, and there's just sort of these like deconstructed geometrical shapes. So you look up here on the far left, I mean, this was Picasso painting at 15 years old. Like Picasso painted this at 15. It's like, oh, like he, he knows how to paint realistic images, right? Um, but for Picasso, he gets bored with this kind of stuff. And he's like, he wants to sort of break out, right? And he starts to you know, deconstruct, right, is what it's known, right? So he starts to take like, what are the, 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 the simplest shapes that sort of make up a human face, right? And at 25 years old, right, he gets this painting. Um, and you sit there and you're like, I know he can paint something more realistic, but that's not the point of what he's trying to do. What he's trying to do is sort of create the most basic shapes in order to uh, illustrate what a face is. And then finally, at 89 years old, he's getting even more and more abstract. Um, with some of his paintings, you see not only are they very sort of elementary and abstract in the geometrical shapes, but also the various shapes are sort of misplaced on the body, right? So you have an eyeball here and you have a second eyeball like down here on the right, on the face. Like things get put in these weird places that they, um, you know, uh, biologically wouldn't be, all right? So there is a sort of movement in the art world in the early 20th century where people are getting more and more abstract um, and moving away from more sort of traditional forms uh, of, of, of painting and other artistic expression. Um, if you look at something like modern dance, right? It is uh, this form of like what some people might refer to as like uh, automatic art or art that is sort of participatory. Um, people who aren't trained dancers again since the time they were five years old. Like it, do, it doesn't take 20 years to develop the skill. It is something that could be put together in, let's say a semester uh, at college, right? So if you are not a dancer, but you have to take a dance class for your major or for credit or a gen ed or something, part of that sort of like modern dance class might mean, okay, we have 20 people in this class. You're all novice. None of you have ever danced before in your life. Most of you probably don't even want to dance, but you're taking this for a gen ed. But the final project for this class is that we are going to put together on, you know, some sort of uh, dance production, you know, some sort of 20 minute dance number, and you're all going to have to participate in it. Um, and it is an expression of, uh, you know, emotions, but you start to realize that it, it's more automatic than something that takes, you know, again, 20 years to develop a skill, right? Like, I'm not going to be able to dance the way that a ballerina is, you know, who's who's working at the Bolshoi, which is sort of like the, the world's most famous uh, you know, theater over in Russia. Like, that's not going to happen. All right. Um, and so there is something that's more participatory, more sort of recog like this sort of like everyone can be involved, involved in the creation of art. And then you get the question of like, OK, if everybody can be involved, um, now we're a little bit scared to say, you know, some people are better dancers than others. Like we want to, if, if art is supposed to be this inclusive place, 
then maybe we don't necessarily want to have a hierarchy, right? We don't want to start saying, you know, the principal dancer, you know, from, you know, the, the, who's working at the Bolshoi is better than, you know, this sort of like modern dance um, individual who, you know, has only been dancing for like, you know, two or three years, right? Um, you know, who am I to say that, you know, Swan Lake is better than um, uh, some sort of modern dance number, right? This is where the debate and the tension starts to happen in the art world, right? This elimination of hierarchies. Because if we do go around and we say, okay, the production of a ballet is better than the production of this modern dance number, now we have a hierarchy and that recreates a power structure, which we'll get to next time, marks um, and sort of people who follow marks and cultural studies and stuff, they are, they have a huge distaste for hierarchies, right? They want to eliminate hierarchies. So if we go around and we start to say like anything is better than something else, that repositions a hierarchy. And for Marxist, that's a problem. Um, here we have Van Gogh's Starry Night. And again, Van Gogh is this other sort of like transition figure um, where we look at something like Starry Night and we can sort of see the, we can see how it's, it, it's new. It's a new form of painting like Van Gogh, Cezanne, uh, Cezanne uh, Monet, Monet, like these individuals are still producing interesting works on the canvas that are recognizable, um, that we can see have skill behind them. Um, you know, it's like I couldn't produce this for instance. Uh, however, we do re start to realize that it's starting to sort of deconstruct the, the, the realism uh, that is part of the sort of, you know, classical traditional Renaissance artwork, right? So Van Gogh, Picasso, there are these figures sort of like right in the middle of moving from a more classical style of art production to what we have now is sort of like modern art or uh, abstract artist or um, people known as like automatic art. Um, all right, let's talk about the next slide. Um, oh, real quick. Um, so there's this documentary I, I have people for uh, 204 watch it. I'm going to ask you if you haven't watched it, I would recommend it. It's an hour long documentary, so it's not going to be required. The other two clips you should watch. You should watch The Nutcracker. You should watch Robert Flores' X quick lecture here. Um, but this sort of starts to explain not only the tension um, with regard to the production of art, but uh, the, the filmmakers argue that, you know, this idea of like beauty matters. So when you start to move away from things that are more detailed and beautiful into things that are just sort of like automatic, whatever I put on the page, whatever I put on the canvas, whatever I put on the stage, is it, that's just art and you have to like it. Um, uh, you know, some people are going to like modern dance, some people like ballet, some people will like sort of like, you know, later Picasso, some people like early, it's all, you know, all, you know, it's all, it doesn't matter. This documentary argues that it does matter, um, that beauty does matter and sort of like the, uh, the, the decline of art standards or what qualifies as art has been um, a huge detriment um, to, you know, museums has been a huge detriment to just, you know, life in general <laughs> um, around the world. So you can watch this documentary uh, if you are so inclined. Um, it's about an hour long, but this one's optional. The other videos you need to watch. All right, so now we get into more sort of postmodernist understandings of art. And this is sort of like full on automatic, right? So the first one, and this is discussed in uh, early on in the Why Beauty Matters documentary, um, is this piece uh, uh, by Duchamp, um, and he signs it R. Mutt, right? And this is in the early 20th century. Uh, obviously, it's a urinal, right, from a men's bathroom. He calls it like the fountain. Um, he signs it, and it ends up getting into a museum. And people are like, oh, this is so interesting. And you're making a point, like there's an idea here. Uh, the whole movement around and, and Duchamp says like, you know, he, he's he says like he's trying to do this as like a like a nice little he's he's poking the bear. Right. He's like he's like as he's poking the art world. He's trying to sort of get out of this sort of like high class, you know, um, elite uh, aspect of art, trying to, you know, trying to sort of like throw a bunch of garbage in the art world and say, oh, art is whatever I think it is. Um, we're not going to have standards anymore. We're not going to have objective standards anymore. He was one to sort of throw that in there. And then since then, other people started to sort of follow down that path and say, oh, I can be an artist too. Everyone can be an artist. You don't have to go to school for 20 years. You don't have to work on your craft for 20 years. 
Uh, you don't have to start ballet when you're five if you plan on being a dancer when you're 25. It's like you can just show up at a college class with no experience, and then you know all of a sudden by the end of this, by the end of that semester, you know Josh is a dancer. All right, that's what you know Duchamp is trying to. This is a, one of the points he's trying to make. Is that's like art is in the eye of the beholder. Art can be anything. There are no more objective standards. Like let everybody produce whatever they want. Uh, the idea is important. The execution is not important, right? So if someone walks in and they you know, like. And, and like see the idea or they understand like he's like okay that's art like i got a reaction out of somebody so yay for me and the skill level is no longer um it, it is it is no longer valued right it's just like the idea itself is the only thing that's valued and if i can get my idea across better than somebody else then i win right so the production of the skill the the, the time and effort and energy no longer matters um, you've probably seen some of the, like, and so again, these are more like postmodern. Uh, you have someone like Banksy, um, um, yeah, who, uh, is going around and tagging walls over in, in Europe. A lot of his stuff is sold for lots and lots of money. Um, we'll get, uh, over here. You've probably seen an installation like this. Have you ever gone to a museum? Like this is just like beams on the floor and someone said like, that's our work. One of the things that's like of interest uh if you watch that why beauty matters documentary as you get near the end and there is this sort of traditional sculpture uh sculptor that's interviewed and one thing that he mentions is you know a lot of this sort of um modern art decline into sort of like postmodern uh art is is if you if you saw some of this stuff like on the side of the road you would just keep walking by it right whereas more classical traditional artwork if you saw it on the side of the road you would stop for a second and you'd be arrested by it and you would say oh my gosh like like why is this you know piece of art like you know in an alleyway in a dumpster like you would want to pull it out and maybe even save it or at least look at it or have a lot of questions right if you saw a big pile of beams at a construction site you wouldn't think twice about it if you saw a urinal like you know in an alley you wouldn't think you would walk right by it right um there's something that there's there's something about just sort of like placing these things like in a museum and everyone's like oh my gosh now it's art because of the it, it's been placed into some sort of exhibition hall into some sort of museum that makes me think that it's supposed to be art now and now I'm sort of like really working to trying to figure out like what the artist meant or more cl classical traditional it's like you look at it and you know exactly what it is right it's telling some sort of you know it's telling a, a Greek mythology story it's telling a story from the Bible there's some sort of you know clear story going on about like love or romance or death or destruction or war or like you look at it and you sort of understand the context of it here like we're we're fighting real hard to figure out like you know if i saw this on a construction site it, it wouldn't matter but they put it in a museum now and now i'm supposed to be you know taken aback and trying to figure this out um so again you watch the end of the movie and the sculpture the, the sculptor who's being interviewed uh, does a better job explaining it here all right uh, this is a controversial piece. Um, it's known as Piss Christ, uh, and it's controversial for, for, for a few reasons. Number one, you have a you know a crucifix in a mason jar full of the artist piss. Like that's literally what it is, and so um, that's obviously controversial. Uh, the other reason it's controversial because again, it's more sort of like this automatic art, and you're like, okay, I get it. Like the you know the guy who made this is probably like you know really upset that his parents raised him in a christian household and then he rebelled and you know is, has a problem with the church now right um and then the the final reason it's uh controversial is because it was paid for by the national endowment of arts so there's like a government bank account that sort of gives money out to um various artists to complete their work this is a big interesting case on this issue of um free speech on on taxes on money, like whether or not you know government money should be paying for people's artwork right there's plenty of reasons to sort of like quote unquote fund the arts um but then people say well you know if, if my money is funding the arts like why does my money have to fund this kind of art right like why am i paying you know why am i giving an endowment to an artist so that he can take a crucifix put it in a jar of piss and you know put it on and take a picture of it and you know say that it's artwork um so again, this is more automatic. Uh, and then finally, um, Kathy Griffin over here, she held up this sort of like severed head of Donald Trump and posted it online. I think she took it down a couple of times. She put it back up. She lost a job. She got a job. There's a whole bunch of controversy. She said it was like a performance art piece, right? And again, it's more automatic. And 
the big thing with like all of this that I would mention is that there's something very um, teenage angst about postmodern art. Um, very much sort of like I have an emotion right now and I'm going to sort of spit it all up onto a canvas, onto a floor. I'm going to create this sort of like I have an idea. I really don't like the president, so I'll create this severed head of Trump and this sort of ISIS style, which is sort of like culturally relevant to what's been going on um, in different parts of the world for the last 10 years. Right. Like this whole idea of like beheading has been pretty well documented. Um, in the last couple of years, um, this teenage angst of like, I don't like my, my parents' religion anymore. Like we've all felt these sort of like teenage angst moments. Um, and there's something of like very modern art about it where it's just sort of like, I have an emotion, I just throw it out there and it's automatic. Um, and there's no sort of like careful thought behind it. I'm not trying to create anything beautiful. I'm just trying to tell you that, you know, you know, I have emotions because, you know, I listen to too much Nirvana or something. All right. So there's something yeah, teenage angst about about modern art with regard to its automatic sort of raw emotion um, that some people like. And again, there's plenty of people who say, you know, just because you had a feeling and decided to sort of express yourself in this way doesn't necess doesn't make that art um, or it certainly doesn't make it art worth worthy sort of putting on the floor in a museum. Uh, a couple more, well, a couple final things here. Um, so with regard to architecture, if you watch that uh, Why Beauty Matters documentary, um, the, uh, the, the, the individuals in charge of that movie talk about architecture as like a hugely important thing in our space. So this uh, over here on the right, this is Oxford. It's either Oxford or Cambridge. I can't remember which one right now. You can look it up. I think it's Oxford, right? So a college over in England, right? And you look at it and you're like, wow, that, that's a college you want to be on. Like, that's a college you're going to go and you're like, ooh, I better, I better be on time. I better put a suit and tie on when I come to class, <laughs> right? Um, I'm going to learn some. I better have my books in order. Like, professor, like, I don't even think a smart, like, you look at it and you're like, I don't even know if I can bring my smartphone on campus, let alone, like, into the classroom, right? There's just something about this view of, like, walking onto a campus like this that just makes you feel more scholarly, if you will. Um, this is opposed to sort of um, the assault on architecture. This is mostly out of the 1960s, 1970s. There's this big movement to just make everything very like blocky and concrete. I don't know why, um, but these are various college campuses. This one down here, uh, this is actually Southern Illinois University, which is where I got my PhD. It has this awful, horrible, ugly building that is very confusing to get around. It's just this concrete it's probably like, it's very, it's very, it's a very skinny building. It's probably the length of like two football fields. Super ugly. Everybody hates it, but you're like, why did you do this? Like, you feel like you're going to class inside of a parking garage. And you're like, that's, that's the intellectual heft that we have here is like, I am going inside of a parking garage to, you know, learn. Um, and yeah, and so you have this whole idea of like, you know, is this, does our environment, does the architecture that we produce, does that create a different world in which we live in and inhabit? And does that, that cause people to sort of act and behave and feel uh, a, a, a sense of belonging, um, you know, in, in ways that like this doesn't, right? Um, there's something just very ugly about this. And, you know, postmodernists, uh, they're very concerned about just like function, right? It's like, does it work? Does it work as a class? Can you sit down and can you learn the material? Okay, then like quit your complaining. You know, you don't need to have all this like, you don't need to have all these like flourishes and details. Like that's ridiculous, right? But then there's part of us like emotionally somewhere where like, I kind of want this. Like I kind of want my university campus. Look. Like this is kind of cool, right? And this is a better place to sort of live and learn than, you know, in this concrete monstrosity, all right? Um, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, another critique of this idea that, you know, anything can be beautiful. If you say it's beautiful, anyone can predict it. Like anyone can produce anything they want. Um, let's not have objective standards. So here we go with the postmodernists. They are concerned with objective, uh, objectively good standards. And again, the postmodernists are concerned mostly about hierarchies. Marx is mostly concerned about hierarchies. And part of the way that you create hierarchies is making standards of good and bad, like things that are good and things that are bad, like that creates hierarchies. Um, you know, grades, right? You have a grades in a class, the student who got an A, you know, is smarter than the student who failed the course. And people don't like thinking in terms of like, well, somebody's smarter, somebody's, it's like, no, we're all kind of smart, like, just like, 
you know, you, you teach them like the professor's bad or your, you know, the, the, the test wasn't, you know, uh, in line with the, you know, the failing students like learning abilities or learning standards or the, you know, the, the, the person who gets an A, like they were favored, they have more, whatever. Right. So when you do have hierarchies, they can be a problem. So I'm not saying that hierarchies aren't a problem in some instances, but when you look at it and you say, okay, um, we have a hierarchy. And so instead of taking all the people who are producing, let's say really shitty art and like helping them to develop their skills so they can produce better art. What we do instead is just say like, well, the hierarchy itself is bad. So let's just flatten the hierarchy and everything is subjective, right? So you have a kid getting an A and you have a kid getting a failing grade. And instead of saying like, let's really work with this student who's failing or to get them, we just say, well, let's just flatten the standards and make the test easier, right? Let's just kind of like accommodate everybody's, um, no, let's just accommodate sort of like the ways in which everybody wants to learn sort of like down to the lowest denominator, right? Um, where it's just sort of like everybody gets an A, everybody passes. Um, social promotion is what they call it in K through 12, right? So there's a lot of students in various school districts around the country where it's like they're, they, they um, are not performing at a high school level with like reading and writing and math, but it's like, well, they, they, they hung out in the classroom long enough in sixth grade. So like, we're gonna promote them. They're gonna go to junior high next year. It's like, yeah, but they can't read at a junior high level. It's like, well, then we'll just bring the standards down. Like, we'll just bring the standards down and now everybody can perform at this new lower standard, right? The same is true of like artwork. Like I can't create the Sistine Chapel because um, that's a super high standard. So instead what we're gonna do is be like, well, Josh, if you just like throw some paint at the wall and it sticks on a canvas, um, we'll just lower the standard. And now Josh is a famous artist who gets to put his, you know, painting up in the Louvre or the Guggenheim or, you know, Philadelphia Museum of Art, like whatever it is, right? Um, so postmodernists are concerned with objectively good standards. There are reasons to be, right? Like you don't want this sort of like huge stratification between um, people with regard to hierarchies, but at the same time, you don't want to completely eliminate hierarchies because if we completely eliminate hierarchies, then like if I'm at the bottom, it's like, what am I looking, like where am I trying to go? Like there's no reason for me to sort of like hone my skills or make myself better um, in any facet of life because if everything is a good standard, then I can just kind of stay where I'm at. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm just as an accomplished as art, artist as Da Vinci. It's like, well, then I don't have to try any harder to be a better painter. I don't have to try any harder to be a better uh, dancer or um, writer or student or whatever, all right? So people don't like the idea of objectively good standards because it does create hierarchies, right? It means that some people are better than others. Now it doesn't, now let me stop here, right? It doesn't mean that people are just like better people in all facets, right? The other thing that postmodernists fail to recognize is that there are hierarchies, but there are hierarchies across this sort of like infinite plane of vectors. So I might be a better um, student than you, but I might not be a better painter than you, or I might not be um, uh, a, a better uh, employee than you, right? So just because we eliminate hierarchies, we, everyone's, you know, everyone's now the same. Part of the problem with that is like, well, you might have, you know, like, there's other ways in which people can perform to sort of prove their talents, right? Just because I'm better at one thing doesn't mean that I'm better at all things. Just because you're really, really bad at one thing doesn't mean that you're bad at all things. So there are multiple vectors in which we can sort of look at, at skill level. Um, and I think the postmodernists are just like, let's just flatten the curve across the board for everybody. Now everybody's equal, um, but we're all equal at the bottom. As opposed to recognizing like some people have talents and some people don't. Some people are really good painters and some people, you know, take a paintbrush and they flick some paint on a canvas and we say, oh my gosh, that's the best piece. Of, and we're just lying to people, right? It's like, maybe they should be, you know, expressing themselves in other ways or honing their skills in different ways or using their talents in different ways because they're really good at something. They just might not be good at painting, all right? Um, okay, so we have this, 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 this uh, little saying where we say, you know, beauty and everything else. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and so, yeah, like if I find, you know, a urinal, uh, a, a beautiful, um, you know, it's like, why not? Well, maybe there should be some sort of objective standards for um, what counts as sculpture and what should be placed in the museum in order to um, get us not, again, not only, it, it shouldn't be just about eliciting feeling, but it should also be about this recognition of like time and energy and skill uh, that went into the creation of the thing, All right? 
Um, no standards just means more relativity, right? And then you get to this point where it's like, why, why do I need to get excited about anything, right? Um, you know, if there's no standards for like what is good, there's no standards for, you know, uh, what is uh, um, intellectual mastery of an academic skill, right? If there's no standards for judging any of that, it's like, well, why do I need to get excited about everything? Why do I need to really learn anything, right? I can just sort of go out there and say like my experience is, is a site of knowledge production, which we've talked about in other classes before, right? If my experience is a site of knowledge production, I don't need to learn anything outside of myself, right? Or the more traditional classical, um, either academics or scholars or artists will say, no, there are things outside just like you don't know everything. Like you should go out and learn things. Uh, you should go out and try to develop your skills, right? Um, is there any idea of objective truth if every, um, or is everything merely just relative, right? And again, the problem with the knowledge is relative, right? And we all have our own truths is that you, um, is that you then need to ask yourself, why are you wasting time and money in college, right? Um, if everything is just subjective and there's no way to better your skill in order to sort of climb up the hierarchy because all hierarchies have been eliminated now, then what are you doing wasting your time and money trying to develop skills that would allow you to climb some sort of, you know, whatever hierarchy you're at, right? And it's not just about like the money hierarchy. That's what Marx is concerned about is sort of the, um, the gap between super wealthy and super poor, right? But why would you try to climb the hierarchy in any field? Why would you try to hone your skills in any field um, if there's sort of no way to get ahead? All right, and finally, just a couple of names that you should know, and this is sort of you know where we're at on the syllabus, like people like Michel Foucault uh, and Jacques Derrida, um, and you can watch a little bit about them down here in just like a couple minutes with uh, Camille pa uh, Paglia, right? So Michel Foucault uh, is this uh, philosopher from, from the 70s, and he, again, right, he's a postmodernist. He's very concerned with his idea of like power, like how does language create power? Same with Derrida. Right, everything can be broken down. We can never really know the intended meaning of literature. Um, some of, like, I've had students talk to me, uh, about this with me before, and um, Camille Paglia down here, she mentions similar ideas, right? Where if, when you're reading a book, like say it's a classical text, and the entire time, instead, instead of just like enjoying the book and trying to figure out like what is true about the human experience in it, instead like you get into like every little detail with regard to like, um, how is power sort of manifest in this book? Let's just constantly look at power dynamics in this book. It gets very boring. It gets very predictable. And again, it makes students hate reading, right? Um, when students have to sit there and they're reading a text, let's say from the 1800s, um, and you're like, okay, let's talk about the power dynamics. A lot of students roll their eyes, understandably, and they're like, yeah, we get it. The 1800s were extremely sexist and racist, and they marginalized people, and they used bad language towards individuals that weren't part of like their tribe like whatever little geographical tribe you were a part of, right? And if you, that's what Derrida was really, you know, trying to get into with regard to like deconstructing literature, right? Um, now, is language important? Yes, I'm not saying language is not important. Language is obviously important, right? Um, and Michel Foucault points to this a lot, this idea of like, you know, language is important. We should be cautious of the words we use. Um, so language and words create systems and uphold hierarchy. So if we want to change power, structure, we can just change the words we use. This is true, right, to a point, but when you deconstruct words so much, eventually you get to this place where words don't have any meanings. Words to me mean different things than words mean to you, right? The limitation is just because we use different terms, you know, it doesn't make that, it doesn't mean that the objective world around us changes, right? True postmodernists think like if we change the language enough, we can just sort of change the nature of reality, right? Like just change all the language you use and now we sort of change the reality outside of us, right? Um, and I don't think that's true, right? I think we can, we should be changing words to be more inclusive. We should be changing words to not be harmful, um, to not perpetuate hate. Um, but just because we change language and words doesn't mean that we sort of change the reality uh, in the outside world, right? Um, again, if nothing is objectively better than, you know, what sh is it that I should teach you, right? Um, you know, should we read like uh, one of my classes, we just finished up reading Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. It's like, well, we could have read Notes from Underground um, or we could have read, um, we could have read Fifty Shades of Grey. Like, what's the difference, right? They're both books, right? 
Uh, they're both books. They both like I, I could dig a lesson out of Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm sure if I needed to, right? Um, like what you know, what's what's the difference? Like why read classical books as opposed to reading Fifty Shades of Grey? Um, that's the problem, right? It's like why study Swan Lake? Why not just put on, um, you know, why not just put on some sort of modern dance uh, dance video? And then I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you about the, the narrative behind that modern dance video as opposed to, you know, Swan Lake, right? Why are we going to showcase uh, Michelangelo's, the Sistine Chapel? Um, you know, why would, why would we look at that in class as opposed to looking at some sort of like modern art, you know, painting, all right? Um, so that becomes part of the problem. It's like, I have to pick and choose what I put in the syllabus uh, and, you know, reasonably so you know most professors are putting things on the syllabus they think that you should know because they think those things are better than putting other things on the syllabus i put dostoevsky on my syllabus because i think it's a better piece of literature that's going to teach you something in depth than 50 shades of gray all right um all right so watch this quick critique it's only like two minutes it's like an hour-long video but just watch the one minute to three minute 20 second thing um, where she talks a little bit about she's a professor up at uh uh, Pennsylvania University of Pennsylvania School of the Arts, whatever the art school up is in Center City. Um, she's been there for like 30 plus years. Um, and she talks a little bit about sort of like the failures of postmodernism, right? And she talks about, you know, specifically Derrida and how sometimes we get to this point where we're, just, we, we're deconstructing books so much um, that we forget to just sort of enjoy the books as opposed to uh, what we do is we kind of keep looking at the books and we're like, where's power, where's power, where's power, where's power, right? And we'll get into this power conversation when we talk about Marxism next time. Um, so watch uh, The Nutcracker, uh, watch this interview uh, with Dr. Paglia, and then um, watch uh, the Robert Florzak uh, five-minute video on art. If you want to, you can watch the Why Beauty Matters documentary. That's optional, but all four of these things I'll put in the comments below. Um, but again, postmodernist, it's it's all it, it, it is concerned with issues of power. And I'm not saying, you know, issues of power aren't relevant. They are relevant. Right. But it's just a question of like we have hierarchies. Is the goal in life really just to flatten all the hierarchies um, and just make everything sort of like level down here on the ground floor? Or do we have hierarchies and should we instead try to get the people um, who don't have certain skills? Uh, should we try to elevate their skills in order to reach, you know, the precision and the skill level and uh, if we take it into sort of um, the educational attainment etc like we still keep educational standards high but make sure that everybody down here can properly do you know calculus and understands the periodic table and like we don't just want to like eliminate standards and say well everybody passed because they tried right um and there's a way in which postmodernists have done that where they just eliminated all standards and they're like well everybody kind of tried so we all get you know, a participation trophy, as opposed to saying, no, the standards are still going to stay high. There's a lot of people down here who aren't included in these high elite standards. Let's try to continue to keep those standards high, but make sure that everybody has the ability to elevate up towards these sort of high standards of beauty and art and academic attain, uh, uh, attainment, etc. All right. Um, so that's the tension. Okay. Um, we'll talk more about the theoretical stuff with Marxism uh, and what it specifically is on the next video for next class period.